Welcome back everyone and happy Palm Sunday. We're glad to be with you in your homes again, though we miss you terribly and look forward to the time that we are all back here together. Um, a few announcements before the liturgy today. Um, of course, it is Palm Sunday when you would usually receive your palms uh, because we're not together. I encourage you, uh, before you continue on with the service, to take a second, hit pause, go outside uh, wherever you are and grab a branch of a bush or a tree, or if you are in an apartment, um, hold up a house plant, whatever you have, uh, so that when we get uh, in the beginning of the service to the blessing of the palms, you have some piece of green uh, to wave and be blessed and to mark the day. Um, we have a couple of, of great things happening in the service for you today, including, um, well, I'll let you watch, uh, but uh, Michael Sweeney, our seminarian, has been hard at work putting together all sorts of surprises and liturgical delights uh, for us. Uh, a quick word about Holy Week. As you know, today marks the beginning of the holiest week of the year for us in the Christian church. Um, I know that it's a time of struggle and worry for so many. I do think, friends, that this is the week of all weeks and the year of all years to give ourselves entirely to the liturgies, the prayers, uh, and the context of this week. It will, I promise, meet you wherever you are. So to that end, at St. David's, we will have services every day available to you. All can be found on our website. Uh, we will have evening prayer with reflections on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We will have a Monday, Thursday service, a Good Friday service, and a Holy Saturday service. Uh, which are all offered to you through uh, a home-based liturgy packet along with some links to uh, homilies and reflections and other things uh, to help guide you along the way. And then, of course, we will ring out our joy on Sunday together uh, when Easter comes. But do find a time, if you can, each day to set aside your worries, your cares, all that you are doing in your own homes at this point and give yourself to the Holy Week liturgies. I promise um, it will be fruitful. I also want to thank those of you who gave last Sunday online. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we actually did, uh, through your generosity, manage to um, receive about the average amount that we would on a regular Sunday, uh, which is a great gift to us. So please do, following the service, uh, hit that give or donate button if you have been with us for a long time or even a short amount of time and never pledged. There are copious numbers of ways to give and to pledge at this point. Uh, and we do appreciate uh, your generosity in this time of scarcity. Last but not least, uh, we are starting something new here at St. David's uh, at our bishop's request uh, called Spiritual Communion. And to most of us Episcopalians and Anglicans, uh, this is a new concept. Uh, to the Roman Catholic Church, it is an old one. So in looking to uh, some knowledge uh, and uh, kind of more articulate ways to explain to you what I mean by spiritual communion, uh, I looked to Pope Francis uh, and the early Catholic Church. Uh, Pope Francis on March 15th said, United to Christ, we are never alone, but instead form one body of which he is the head. It is a union that is nourished with prayer and also with spiritual communion in the Eucharist, a practice that is recommended when it isn't possible to receive the sacrament. Obviously, friends, receiving the sacrament, receiving communion together uh, is the way to participate most fully in our mass, but it's not always possible for all of us to receive. 
So instead, the idea of spiritual communion came out of the 1700s uh, when Saint Alphonsus Liguri wrote a special prayer for spiritual communion, and I'd like to share it with you just for a moment. He wrote, my Jesus, I believe you are really here in the blessed sacrament. I love you more than anything in the world, and I hunger to receive you. But since I cannot receive communion at this moment, feed my soul, at least spiritually. I unite myself to you now as I do when I actually receive you. Amen. Friends, to that end, because we cannot all share in the Eucharist together, Bishop Marianne and other bishops around the Episcopal Communion have asked us to offer spiritual communion. So we will not be receiving, uh, just as you are not receiving, so that we all can join ourselves together in this idea of spiritual communion. And I would point out that in our own post-communion prayers, uh, we pray, thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most holy body and blood. It is a part of who we are now and always has been. So I pray that it will feed you and nourish you uh, in all of the ways necessary until we can gather again and break bread in real time. Friends, I'm so glad to be with you today. I hope that this liturgy inspires and consoles in whatever ways needed. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and for the sake of love gave everything.
comes in the name of the Lord. Peace, Peace in heaven, heaven and, and glory in the highest. Friends, let us pray. Assist us mercifully with your help, O Lord God of our salvation, that we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts whereby you have given us life and immortality. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus and his disciples had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. I know most of you don't have palm trees in your backyard, but if you do have branches that you have cut from whatever bushes or trees you have nearby, hold those branches up high. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, almighty God, for the acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. On this day, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph and was proclaimed as King of Kings by those who spread their garments and branches of palm along his way. Let these branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who lives and reigns in glory with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. highest. Friends, let us go forth in peace. In, in, in the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.
almighty and ever-living God, in your tender love for the human race, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take upon him our nature and to suffer death upon the cross, giving us the example of his great humility. Mercifully grant that we may walk in the way of his suffering and also share in his resurrection through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now for the readings. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him. Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. 
They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes amongst themselves by casting lots. And they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. In the name of the ever-blessed Trinity, one God, amen. amen. Ever since I was a child, Palm Sunday has seemed to me to be confusing. Think about it. We start out commemorating Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, holding, raising, waving palm branches, just as the crowds of Passover pilgrims did as they accompanied Jesus into the great and holy city. The liturgical flourishes our tradition usually offers in this commemoration can be quite stirring. Festive hymns of glory, laud, and honor, a parade of parishioners, young people, and maybe not just young people, enjoying the chance to get out of the pews and move around. In the parish I served in New Haven, Connecticut, the tradition was for bagpipes, drummers, and organ to accompany the procession with the beautiful tune of Highland Cathedral. For many, this sort of celebratory experience is one of several absolute liturgical highlights of the year. It is festive at first. How quickly, though, the skies darken. Betrayal slithers onto the scene. Still surrounded by crowds, Jesus is no longer riding in majesty to acclamations of Hosanna to the son of David, no. He is turned in, 
betrayed by Judas, one of the twelve, one of his closest followers. Jesus is arrested and stands trial before crowds now suddenly shouting that he should be crucified. Are these the same crowds? Did they change their minds? Jesus is mocked, tortured, crucified, and seemingly abandoned even by God. Jesus cries aloud from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How did we suddenly get here? What does it all mean? For many young people, and maybe not just for them, this dramatic turnabout is utterly strange. It is, in fact, confusing. Perhaps the most profoundly perplexing twists are those involving betrayal. Judas, for example. Judas' story doesn't make any sense when you think about it. Why did one of Jesus' most intimate followers, the man John's Gospel said managed the apostles' money, why did this close friend of Jesus betray him so heartlessly? Why, as Matthew's Gospel records, would Judas agree to show the temple guards where to find Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, only to turn around when Jesus was condemned to death and throw the 30 pieces of silver at the feet of the chief priests and then go hang himself? Are those the actions of a greedy thief? Someone in it for the money? Confusing. What about the crowds before Pilate, demanding that the Roman governor release Barabbas instead of Jesus, who had been hailed as the messianic son of David as he entered the city? Who was this notorious prisoner, as Matthew calls him, whom the people seemed to love more than Jesus? John's Gospel calls Barabbas a robber. But Mark and Luke drill deeper, explaining that Barabbas was an insurrectionist who had committed murder in a Jewish uprising against Roman rule. Common events in that time. What could possibly have made the crowds choose radical, violent Barabbas over a generally peaceable rabbi? Why would they, albeit, as only Matthew says, scream out lustily that Jesus' blood be upon them and their children? a turn of phrase that has been used for centuries to justify all manner of wicked and vile and murderous anti-Semitism. Again, confusing. And then there is the agony on the cross. After hours stretched across wooden beams exposed to all elements, gradually unable to breathe for lack of bodily support, Jesus faces the unthinkable. God, it seems, has abandoned him. He is somehow in that moment beyond hope. He cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This gentle man, who knew God always heard him, gave up, and then he died. Abandoned, alone, and in agony, with God seemingly nowhere to be found, betrayed ultimately even by God the Father. How did we get here so quickly? And what does it mean? Well, Judas and Barabbas might have more in common than is obvious at first. If Judas' despair to the point of suicide happened only after Jesus was condemned to die, perhaps his purpose had actually, had only been, to force Jesus' hand to make the Messiah take action to overthrow the Roman overlords, because there would be no other choice. From such a perspective, advanced, for example, by Anglican Bishop John A.T. Robinson, Judas' despair and suicide make sense. His betrayal suddenly became not just a ploy, but real. His friend would die, and he had his own hand in it. It seems quite plausible that Judas did not understand, or did not want to understand, what Jesus' identity as Messiah must mean. Judas 
wanted something different. In light of this thinking, the rowdy crowd's rejection of Jesus in favor of the one Mark calls an insurrectionist makes good sense. Whether or not these were the same crowds that had hailed Jesus as son of David not long before, the fact remains that they chose Barabbas. It was the insurrectionist they wanted, perhaps even the insurrection itself. The people chose Barabbas and demanded the death of Jesus. The people wanted something different. And then Jesus, having freely accepted this course, his own death, died a horrible death on the cross. But not before crying out in despair in his final moments, begging for God the Father to account for having abandoned him. Yet here is to be found the very point. And it is something that Michael spoke of in his excellent sermon last week. The death of Jesus, in all its extended agony, humiliation, and hopelessness, this death was among the worst one could suffer, and Jesus, the Son of God, chose to submit to it. And then God did a new thing, and turned this hellish nightmare into something else, but not before entering fully into, assuming, experiencing this mortal agony and despair in Christ. And this is the game changer. God in Christ took this horror and transformed it into resurrection. And God offered to us the profound knowledge that no horror, no despair, is unknown to God or would ever have the final word, would ever be unfelt by God. And so you see, God too wanted something different. God wanted this this most intimate connection with us. In his book, The Crucified God, German theologian Jürgen Moltmann illustrates what this means by drawing on post-Holocaust theology, particularly a version of the rabbinic theology of God's humiliation. Seeing in this an idea related to the Christian theology of the cross, Moldman quotes Holocaust survivor Eli Wiesel, who in his book Night recounted his experiences in Auschwitz. Wiesel says this, The SS hanged two Jewish men and a youth in front of the whole camp. The men died quickly, but the death throes of the youth lasted for half an hour. Where is God? Someone asked behind me as the youth still hung in torment in the noose after a long time, I heard the man call again, Where is God now? And I heard a voice in myself answer, Where is God? He is here. He is hanging there on the gallows. God suffers with us. God understands our suffering. What a wonderful theological supposition. But what good does it really do us? What good does it do us right now, surrounded as we are by danger, death, and despair? Right now, when a virus burns through our country and the world like a wildfire? Well, I wish I knew. Is God gasping for air somewhere on a ventilator, so fully experiencing divine compassion for us? Has God collapsed in exhaustion in the corner of a hospital emergency department, still running the risk of deathly infection for our sake? Does it matter? Does it matter to you? Where is God? As we ponder such questions throughout this Holy Week, perhaps one consolation is that we are not helpless or disempowered. Yes, we are for the most part staying at home and being safe, which is as it should be. We are washing our hands, we are entertaining our children, we are learning new games, we are discovering how to make masks out of old t-shirts, 
And we are pondering ways of dealing with hair that won't stop growing before the salons and barbershops eventually open up again. Of course, we pray. Fervently. I must confess, though, that this pandemic has challenged my prayer life. Praying for an end to this pandemic, as the Washington Post says that half of all Americans are doing, praying for an end feels much like praying for peace in the world. Yet pray we must. It's what God calls us to do. But beyond all this, we are also able to reach out in compassion. To donate, for example, to support the most vulnerable in our midst. For me this past week, this meant organizing a matching grant program for Allianz's companies across the U.S. to raise and then match funds for youth at risk. $50,000 altogether for youth who are homeless, hungry, or overwhelmed in this pandemic crisis. And to be honest, this wasn't even something that just spontaneously occurred to me. It came to me in answer to a colleague's question asking what we might be able to do to help. The question rattled me, helpless as I felt. And then it inspired me to action. What might you be able to do? A good place to start was offered recently by Rabbi Yosef Konevsky of Los Angeles, who wrote this. Every hand that we don't shake must become a phone call that we place. Every embrace that we avoid must become a verbal expression of warmth and concern. Every inch and every foot that we physically place between ourselves and another must become a thought as to how we might be of help to that other, should the need arise. Amen, Rabbi. Amen to that. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we, we all, all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you, that your, your name, name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, that, that they, they may be faithful, faithful ministers of your, your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that, that there, there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our, that our works, works may find, find favor, favor in your sight. sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that and they may be delivered, delivered from, from their distress. distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let, Let light's perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we, we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Friends, let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Today we pray especially for all those who are sick, alone, those who are hungry. We pray for Kathy, Anne, Charlie, Paul, Laura, and Michael. We pray, too, for all those who are serving, those who are sick and lonely. We give thanks for them. And we pray for those who have died, especially Joe Pauly and Ellen Maxwell. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which, which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. If you are at home, but yet with family members nearby, please do offer uh, a kiss or a hug of peace if you are 
alone in this time of worship, know that we offer you our peace. to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for our sins he was lifted high upon the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself. And by his suffering and death, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels, and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, 
the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity and constancy and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, friends, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have, Have mercy on us. And Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have, Have mercy on us. O Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant Pray us peace. Saying together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Behold what you are, become what you receive. Eternal God, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with the spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon each of you and those beloved to you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.